All right. <clears throat> so I gave you all a little break from the Calvinism study that we've been doing, but we're right back in it again tonight. And forgive me, I know some of this can be a little bit boring. Hopefully it's not too boring. Hopefully it's being presented in a way that, uh, that's not putting you to sleep. I don't think anyone's fallen asleep yet during these studies, but um, unfortunately... There is a very pervasive doctrine of Calvinism that actually infects a lot of Baptist churches even. There's a lot of, it's mostly Reformed churches, but it even gets into some Baptist churches. And uh, it's something that needs to be handled, needs to be dealt with. In fact, one, um, Joseph and Angelica just this afternoon ran into someone that believes in, who is a Calvinist, that, that believes this stuff. So it's important to be able to understand what they believe and just and really what the Bible teaches. So the way I'm going to handle this, what, what I'm teaching on tonight is uh, the P in their tulip. So if you, if you want to understand or remember what Calvinists believe, they have an acronym and it's tulip. And the last one is that P. They believe in the perseverance of the saints. So that what that basically means, just, just in a nutshell, they believe that if a person is saved, if you are truly saved, right, a real saved person, then you will endure you will persevere you will keep that faith you will do what you know whatever it's whatever comes your way you will end up persevering all the way to the end all the way until you die that that is you are you are this you will do that and if you don't do that then you're never really saved to begin with and that's the catch you see that's the the trick right there is that it well you get you know if someone believed or whatever else well if they didn't actually persevere then they were never saved to begin with and we're going to see why this is a dangerous doctrine. And it's really tied in. You, you have to have the, like kind of all five points of Calvinism to really be a Calvinist at all. Because as soon as you start messing with any one doctrine, it all interferes with other doctrines. And um, it's just the way it works. I, I don't see how you can take one and not the other when it comes to this type of, of uh, belief system. But the reason why we started here in Ephesians chapter 6 is because this is the one and only time any form of the word persevere exists in the King James Bible. And that's in, look at verse number 17 here. We'll start reading. Excuse me. The Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. So there's the word perseverance. Um, it's not that important if the word necessarily is used, but although it's, it's the P in their, in their doctrine, which is found one time in the entire Bible. We're, what I'm going to do, and the way I'm going to present the material tonight, is I'm going to explain biblical perseverance and biblical preservation. Because what we believe is not that... If you're truly saved, you, your faith will endure to the end. And there's not, you know, like in it, the way that the Calvinists believe it. What we believe is that once you're saved, God has, you will preserve you. Your, your spirit is, is preserved. You're, you're born again and you cannot lose that salvation. Now, the tricky thing with Calvinism is all, what they'll do is they'll use the same verses that we do to prove that you can't lose your salvation. Because they'll say, once you're, basically, once you're saved, you're saved eternally. That is what their doctrine will state, is that you, you, you're saved. You have eternal security. That's exactly what we believe, is that once you're saved, you are saved forever. You're guaranteed to be saved forever. They use verses like John 5, 24, which is my personal favorite verse in the whole Bible, which I use virtually every time I go out soul winning. In John 5, 24, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I love that verse. It explains eternal security so perfectly that you have it. It's, it's present tense. You have eternal life. And when I was studying up for this, I'd already determined I was going to just show what perseverance is from the Bible, how it does apply to believers, and what preservation is, just to get those concepts across so we're not getting screwed up with any Calvinist doctrine. But I went to just see, what do these people teach and what do they believe? And I was kind of astonished at, at how much they use these great verses that explain eternal security. 
Because I'm looking at that and saying, well, how do you come up with this other nonsense when you're, when you're using these clear scriptures, right? And I'm going to get into that a little bit. It's going to be the last point because I'm not here to just, you know, even really try to teach you what is false. So that's why we're going to go over just everything that's correct first. And then I just wanted to make sure that I'm kind of answering what, what a Calvinist might bring up by going through some of the things. So that's my last page. If I run out of time, then too bad. I'm not going to just get to all that. It's more important that we just learn the biblical concepts uh, that's going to be taught tonight just for what they actually mean in the Bible. Now, um, nothing that we see here in this, in this passage in Ephesians 6 gives you any indication that if you are truly saved, you will basically endure all things and you're going to persevere and you're going you're gonna to just stand by God every step of the way. It just says that praying always, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So that's a, a watching thereunto with perseverance. That's what it's talking about. And um, not ne even necessarily talking about anything about salvation, but um, it's just talking about praying and watching. So, but even though the word isn't used that often the concept is still there so the doctrine really comes from these other verses and we're going to look at some of these verses um, turn if you would to Psalm 89 I'm going to read for you from Job 31 because right, right you know in the word we're going to it's kind of a, a word study I'm going to be going through some of the passages that use the word endure because the word endure is, is basically the same thing as persevere. You're enduring afflictions, you're enduring whatever, and, and, and you're persevering. So it's a synonym. It's something that we could look at uh, if we're going to understand the concept of persevering. You're enduring. And enduring is used way more often in the Bible. One of the times that, that endure is used is in Job 31, verse 23. The Bible reads, For destruction from God was a terror to me, and by reason of his highness, I could not endure. So by, 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 the, you know, by God's magnificence and his power and his greatness, by reason of his highness, Job was saying, I could not endure. Now, was Job, Job saved? Of course he was. But we see here just an example of, the, of using, you know, usage of that word endure. He said, I could not endure. Well, that doesn't line up with Calvinist doctrine saying that, you know, if you're truly a saint, you're going to endure, Right? Uh, Psalm 89 is where I had you turn. Look at verse number 29. There's a verse that a Calvinist might use. Um, hopefully not, though, because it's not just referring to a believer. The Bible says in verse 29, His seed also will I make to endure forever, and His throne as the days of heaven. But um, if you're, you can't apply this just a believer because this is talking about Christ. Psalm 89, 29 is talking about Christ. I mean, who else has an everlasting throne? It says, and his throne as the days of heaven. It's the seed which in the Old Testament wasn't born yet physically, and that's Christ. Look at verse 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Again, in the context, and you could look up, read the rest of Psalm 89. You'll see it's very clear in the context that this is talking about Christ. This portion of the scripture keeps referring to David in the context of Psalm 89 and his seed, which is referring to Christ, the king to come with the everlasting kingdom, the everlasting throne. Um, that eternal throne, and it's mentioned twice in this passage. You're in Psalm 89, flip over to Psalm 102. We're going to see some other usages of endure, of just what endures. What is it that endures and, uh, and actually perseveres? Because it's not necessarily the saints that, that are always going to persevere. And there's many times this is used, so you'd have to look it up for yourself. I can't, I, there's just not enough time to go through every single time these words appear. But I just want to get these concepts across because they are important to understand what the endurance is. Look at verse, uh, Psalm 102, verse number 11. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever in thy remembrance unto all generations. God endures forever. 
Look, jump down to verse number 24. I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. So we see here God enduring. God endures every. God doesn't change. God's gonna gonna continue forever and ever. And the other thing we have to keep in mind too, and I'll just mention this now. I had this this way later in my notes, but as we're going through these, we're gonna look at perseverance. We're gonna look at preservation. Try to keep in mind, especially in the context, what it's referring to. Is it referring to spiritual or is it referring to physical? Because they're two different things, right? The Calvinist doctrine is going to teach that it's a spiritual thing, that you know, your, your faith is going to endure or persevere all the way through. But many of the passages that they may use or may or may not use, I didn't study everything that they use to, to, to prop up their false doctrine. But these are references that I found I think are very pertinent to just get a proper understanding of perseverance and then preservation. So we see God persevering, and we're going to see things you know, physically and spiritually here in the passage. Psalm 107, here in Psalm 102, so over Psalm 107, verse number 1. But we don't give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That's a statement that's found many, many times in the Bible. God's mercy lasts forever. It endures. God's mercy does not stop. It doesn't quit. It doesn't fail. It endures forever and ever. And that's great news for us. And notice it does not say only if you keep his commandments and endure as a Christian. His mercy endures forever. We don't have to just continually keep his commandments and endure just all the way to the end in order to receive mercy from him. The moment we're saved, we receive the mercy from our sins not being imputed unto us. Now, um, things that endure forever, and, and, and again, there's just too many references for this, but I wrote down kind of a list of all these different, these various things that do endure. So we're talking about endurance, we're talking about perseverance, the things that continue on all the way through to the end. God's name endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. His judgments endure forever. His righteousness endures forever. His praise endures forever. His truth endures forever. And his dominion endures forever. But look at all of these things are attributes of God. Things that are associated with God that endures forever. God endures forever. Turn, if you would, now to the New Testament. Look at Matthew chapter 10. When you look at the perseverance, you look at the endurance that's found in the Bible, way more often than anything else you're going to find it's associated with God or an attribute of God. Those are the things that endure forever. God's promise endures forever. And he's given us, you know, the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Hey, that promise is, is an enduring promise that can't be changed. So that's another, good, you know, more good news for us. But um, Matthew chapter 10, we're going to see here a scripture that I'm pretty sure that they do go to. Um, I'm almost positive I've heard Calvinists use these types of, of passages to prove their doctrine of, see, you have to endure unto the end. We're going to start reading in verse number 19 of Matthew chapter 10. The uh, Bible reads, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. 
But when they persecute you in this city, flee you into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. They'll take passages like this, and if you want, you can turn to Matthew 24, and then they'll also pull from Mark 13. Mark 13 and Matthew 24 are parallel passages. They're basically the same sermon that Jesus was preaching. So it's the same content all being covered, just um, with, with a little bit different uh, information given in each one, but still both completely accurate and both completely the words of Jesus Christ. But um, because they're parallel passages, they might pull from one or the other. But we saw there, but wait a minute, you know, how do you answer that? He says, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Well, every, first of all, every time you see the word saved, it's not necessarily talking about your soul being saved. You have to consider the context. What is being saved? How will you be saved? Well, in the context of Matthew 10, where we're saying, it says, brother shall deliver up the brother to death. It says, the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. We're talking about people betraying their own family in order to be executed, in order to be put to death. This is prophetic, and we're going to see the same exact thing coming out of Matthew 24. This is talking about future events where, you know, when the Antichrist comes into power and makes war against the saints, and you're going to have people of your own family, of your own household, unbelievers are going to be turning you in because you believe on Jesus Christ. And they're going to be turning you in saying, yeah, they're one of those guys. They're, they're those believers. They're those Christians. And they're going to be turning you in to, be, to have you be put to death. And it says in verse in, in where we were in Matthew 10, 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Everybody's going to hate you because you believe in Christ, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. See, there's going to be this war where Satan, the Antichrist, is going to want to kill every believer. And he would kill every believer if Jesus Christ doesn't come back prior to that. But Jesus will come back prior to his uh, conclusion of, of exterminating every believer. And that's why those that, that endure to the end, the end meaning when Jesus comes back, shall be saved because they're going to be saved physically. You know, spiritually, they've already been saved when they, when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. But physically, they will not have to endure that death because Jesus is going to come back. Uh, we see, and we see this again in Matthew 24. Look at verse number 9. And you'll notice the wording is very, very similar to what we saw in Matthew 10. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It's basically the same thing we saw in Matthew 10. Ver, uh, verse 10 here, Matthew 24. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Matthew 10 was a little more specific about your family doing that, but this is just a little bit more broad in general, saying, you know what? People are going to be offended. They're going to betray each other. They're going to hate either each other. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And again, Matthew 24, get it in context. You read, the disciples ask Jesus, you know, what shall be the sign of thy coming? What are things going to be like? When are you coming back? What's it going to be like? And this was his answer. Jesus hasn't come back yet. This is a future time event. This is something that's going to happen. This is not talking about someone's soul being saved. This is not talking about, see, Jesus taught that you have to persevere unto the end in order to be saved. That's ridiculous. This is a future end times prophecy uh, event that he is explaining and describing here, and it's a physical death you're being saved from, not your spiritual death. Um, Mark 13, again, I'm not going to go through those passages because it's the same thing that you'll find in Matthew 24. Um, another passage here is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse number 27. The Bible reads, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now this lines up perfectly, and, and, and look, all of these line up perfectly with what we believe, okay? But this is explaining that the meat endures. It says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. So he's saying, don't worry about the things in this world, 
right? That are going to perish, are going to they're going to pass away, but we need to be laboring for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the God the Father sealed. So the enduring thing here, again, the endurance in context is the meat. It's not the person that's, that's keeping their faith. It's what they have attained that, it, that endures unto the end. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 13 is, a, is the uh, charity chapter. The Bible says that charity uh, in verse 7, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So charity endures all things. Charity is a caring, a love for other people that is able to endure whatever comes its way. Charity has that attribute of being able to endure, but does, a, does the, the, the same person always have charity? No. Charity in the Bible is like putting on the bond of perfection. That's the, the Charity is like the is kind of the almost like the final state that you could achieve as a Christian is is that you could add to your to your walk with God and, and, and to your characteristics is having charity. Not everyone has charity all the time. Uh, it's it's something that if you do have charity all the time, then you'd be able to endure all things. But not every believer is just always going to be filled with charity at all times. Um, let's see here, James. You don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to First John chapter five. You know what, this is, these are all real close together. Anyways, you could turn to James chapter 1 if you'd like. James chapter 1. This is actually a pretty important point, and it's one that I want to make sure is explained uh, adequately. This is, this is definitely what I've, I've seen this um, being used to try to support that if someone's truly saved, they'll endure to the end. They'll endure all things. James 1, verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So it just starts off saying, you know what, if you can endure temptation or testing and trials, then you're blessed. Right? That's, so far, it's all it's saying. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, this begs the question, what is the crown of life? Is the crown of life salvation or is it something else? If the crown of life that's referred to here is salvation, it's eternal life. If it is, then salvation is definitely by works. It, it would have to be. Because the rest of that verse says, He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love Him. Now, how, how is it possible? Like, how do we show that we love Him? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says, For this is the love. Here we get a definition of the love of God. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. If we love God, we will keep His commandments. Now, is that how you get saved, though? By keeping His commandments? No. Right off the bat, then you're going to have this contradiction. So, in order to understand James 1.12, when you see that crown of life, we know from a multitude of other scriptures that this can't be talking about eternal. This can't be talking about your salvation. This cannot be talking about your soul being saved because otherwise that would inherently have to imply that you have to love God and keep his commandments in order to receive the salvation. Now, this is a crown that you receive. And that's why it's important that crown is even put in, the, in, in this verse. It's a crown of life. There are multiple crowns that you can earn. This is a reward that's granted to the believer based on how they lived in this life. At the judgment seat of Christ, when all of your works are tried... And how much you've done for God that has eternal value, that endures through the everlasting life, that is when you're going to receive for what you've done. And some people are going to receive this crown of life. It's a crown. It's something that's put on you. And what does a crown imply? You're going to be ruling, right? You're going to be reigning. And the people who are going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ are going to be the ones who actually did the most for Christ. They're going to be, you know, be thou over five cities, be thou over ten cities, because they showed themselves faithful in this life. 
That's what this is talking about. I mean, again, if it's not, then you have inherent contradiction. If this is just talking about salvation, then what do you do with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? What do you do with all the other verses that, that clearly illustrate that salvation is, is not of works? The Bible says, For by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, if it's referring to our salvation. It's not. And 1 John 5, 3 gives a perfect definition of loving God. You love God, you keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Turn if you go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And verse number 10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So here we see another example of people enduring. And what he's doing here is illustrating people who are a good example. People who have lived a good life and, and you know, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, of patience, people who did it right and, ha and did end up keeping the faith, right? Did keep it to the end. And he's saying, we count them happy which endure. And we saw what happened with Job. We saw how he kept his faith and he stayed with it the whole way and how God blessed him for that in the end. This is a proper teaching, but the reason why they're even teaching is like, why would you even have to explain all that? if you're just automatically going to endure because you are saved. Why, why are we even being exhorted to endure if it's going, like, you know, the Calvinism makes no sense at all. We're constantly being admonished to do things that in their understanding, it's just automatic. It's just going to happen because God wills it so. There's so many things that are conditional and that we're given instruction to do and some people do this and some people don't. And you're going to be blessed if you do this and not if you don't. But it's not talking about our salvation. 1 Peter 2.19, you have to turn there. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. If. If somebody does that. If they don't do that, it doesn't mean they're not saved. It's just saying, if you do... If someone happens to do this, if they endure grief and they suffer wrongfully for the cause of Christ, then that's thankworthy. God appreciates that. They're going to be rewarded for that. That's a good thing. Let's see. I'm doing all right on time here. I, I've, got, I've got a lot of pages of notes. So I'm trying to hurry through this. One of the points I thought while I was preparing for the sermon is you know, they'll teach that if, if someone doesn't endure, they must not have been saved, right? If they, if they just, oh, this person got out of church, then they must not have been saved. And they use whatever standard they want as far as endurance, right? Because the, the whole thing is just they talk out of both sides of their mouth. What, you know, because they're, you know, whoever teaches this, of course they're saved. Of course they're the elect, right? Of, of course they're going to endure, but then they have to answer for, well, what about their own sins? What about the things that they do wrong? Are they not enduring? Oh, well, no, no. I mean, we're all sinners, but you see, we just can't do whatever. So it's something that they're not doing in order to endure, right? If you do this, then you're not enduring and you never were saved to begin with. And it's always the things that, that they're not guilty of, but that's just ridiculous. But what happens... If a person has love and peace, but then they turn apostate, right? You see a person, and you're observing them, you say, wow, this person's got a lot of love, they seem real peaceful, and then they just renounce Jesus or whatever. The reason why I bring that up is because people say, oh, by their fruits you shall know them, right? And what, they, what they'll explain by that is, well, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, right? And they look at those things and say, this is how we know if someone's saved, because if they're showing these things. Well, those are the fruits of the Spirit, no doubt. But a person can still exhibit that type of behavior 
and still not be saved, right? right? And um, on the flip side, a person can be saved and not necessarily exhibit those types of behavior. But what if someone, you know, if, if that's your, your measuring stick, if that's how you're going to judge it, if that's what bearing fruit really means, then how do you deal with a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit? Uh, and a good tree cannot bring forth uh, bad fruit, right? That's, that cannot be your standard of what does it even mean to produce fruit. Producing fruit is, is your convert. It's who it is that you have won to Christ, who it is that, that you have evangelized and uh, have converted under your way of thinking. So, um, because the one thing that an that a unbeliever can't do is win somebody to Christ, for sure. And that's how you're going to know who is a, a true convert and who is not. But let's go on here. Turn, if you go to Genesis chapter 45. I'm going to switch gears now from, pre, from uh, perseverance to preservation. The vast majority of the times there's that perseverance or enduring is used. It's referring to God and his endurance and his attributes that endure forever. In none of these that we went to is it ever really talking about or, or explaining this doctrine of if you're saved, you're going to endure to the end. And the only thing close to that was the end times prophecies in Matthew 10 and Matthew 24. That's like as close as you can get. But now we're going to look at the preservation. Because this is, we believe as believers that we are preserved through Christ. We're preserved in Him. The Holy Spirit that He seals us with preserves us all the way up until the day of, uh, up until the day of redemption. The redemption of our bodies. Uh, Genesis 45, look at verse number 5. We're going to see here where God uses Joseph to preserve Israel. Uh, the Bible reads, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God preserves life. God preserved the life here of the children of Israel and of Joseph by providing them with food during the famine that they would not die off. We see, uh, and you don't have to turn to a lot of these places. Um, I'm just going to kind of blow through most of these because I, I do want to get to some of those teachings at the end. The preservation of God's word, we see that God preserved Israel not only through Joseph, he preserved Israel when he delivered them from Egypt and led them through the wilderness. In Joshua 24, 17, the Bible reads, For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. God preserved them at that point also. God preserved David. 2 Samuel 8, 6 says, Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Verse 14 reads, And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he, put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. We're seeing here... Uh, um, a pattern of God preserving his people. Whoever his people are. It was the, the children of Israel with, through Joseph. The children of Israel through, through um, Egypt, being delivered from Egypt. It was David being one of his people being uh, preserved. And whatever he did, God was preserving. God was with him. Uh, the Bible explains that God preserves the whole world, that everything that exists here is going to be preserved by God. That's one of God's jobs is to preserve you know, the earth, the sea, the heaven, and all these other things. We don't have to get worried and scared about an apocalypse happening because God is going to preserve this earth until Jesus comes again and he's the one who's going to destroy this earth. We don't need to worry about these asteroids. We don't need to worry about you know, global warming. We don't need to worry about these things happening and just killing off the entire human race because it's not going to happen. Nehemiah 9.6 says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, 
the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven worshipeth thee. God preserves all of those things. The heaven, the earth, the sea, everything, and everything that lives in them. God is the one responsible for preserving them. Um, God preserves his word. Of course, a famous passage in Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Turn, if you would, to, uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm 37. There are many passages, and I don't have them all written down here, of God preserving the saints. Now that word saint, I don't want that to throw you off because of teachings from the Catholic Church or whatever. You know, the churches I'll teach, well, if you're a saint, then you're really living a good life and you're kind of exceeding and excelling in the faith and doing all this good work. But that is literally not, that is not what the word literally means. The word saint just comes from the word that's, that's sanctified. Anyone who is sanctified is a saint. And if you're sanctified, you're set apart, you're cleansed. Well, how is it that we become sanctified? It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that, it's that complete washing. It's that complete pardon and, and, and washing away of all of our sins. That doesn't happen through our own good merits or our own good works. That only happens through Christ. So anybody who has Christ, anyone who's in Christ, anyone who's received Christ as their Savior is a saint. They are sanctified. Amen. Psalm 37, verse 28, reads, For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. God doesn't forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. God's saints are preserved forever. This is exactly what we believe. Just like every other passage that we've read, we believe with the understanding that God, once you're saved, God is going to preserve you forever because you belong to Him and you've been sanctified. 2 Timothy 4.18, you have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. 2 Timothy 4.18 reads, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God preserves the saints. He preserves His people. We saw in the Old Testament preserving Israel. In the New Testament, we're seeing him preserving every believer. Jude, verse 1, reads, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. We are preserved in Christ. Other verses that teach preservation without using that word preserve would be like Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a promise of God that he can't go back on. He hath which begun a good work. When you get saved, you have that spirit born again inside of you. That is a good work that has begun. And he will perform that work, it says, until the day of Jesus Christ. That work will not cease. He's not going to just cut it off and be like, well, I started this good work, but I'm just going to throw it in the trash now and forsake it. Not going to happen. Ephesians 1.13, this is actually printed on our invitations. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Again, teaching that we are preserved, we are sealed, we belong unto God, and he is going to keep us and not forsake us. We're not going to lose our salvation in, in, for any reason. None of these verses give any type of indication or reason of how you may not be preserved. They're all unconditional preservation once you belong to him. Once you're in Christ. Psalm 89, where I had you turn. Look at verse number 26. Psalm 89, verse 26. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. 
Look at who this is talking about. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Who does that sound like? My firstborn. He's going to say unto me, Thou art my Father, my God. He's the firstborn. It's Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. This is the new covenant. Verse 29. Now look at this. His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So did Jesus Christ have any physical seed on his earth? No. He was unmarried. He was without sin, which means he didn't fornicate. And, and being unmarried, he didn't have children. So this is not talking about his physical seed. This is talking about spiritual seed. This is talking about people who are born again, who are born through the word of God. His seed also will I make to endure forever. And there's that word endure. He's going to make us to endure forever. Being preserved. And that's what he's, you know, this is in the context talking about preservation. It's not saying that when persecution arises, you will always do what's right. It means you are kept through Christ. His seed also I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. Let's keep, and, and this is very clearly identified as we keep reading. Verse number 30. If his children, look at this, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, then they were never really saved to begin with. Is that what it says? Oh, wait, no, let's keep reading. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then they were never really saved. Nope. Let's keep reading. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. He says, you're going to get beat for that. You're going to get chastised for that. Verse 33, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. God's faithfulness never fails. When he is going to be faithful to a promise, faithful to what he's done, he can't go back on it. He says, I cannot utterly take away my faithfulness. I'm not utterly going to remove my loving kindness from them. Verse 34, my covenant, it says promise, will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. So once I say something, that's it. That's the way it's going to stand. I promised eternal life. I promised that they will receive salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot break that promise. So once, I did, once I've done that, once I've given them eternal life, I can't take it back. I can't make it no longer eternal. Now if they break my statutes and don't keep my commandments, I'm going to visit them with the rod. I'm going to set them straight. But they're not going to lose their salvation. Verse 35, Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Now again, his seed being David because we switched the subject from uh, you know, Jesus' seed to David's seed here. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. It is absolutely very, very, very possible, and it does happen. It's not just possible, it happens all the time, of God's children being sinners and committing grievous sins and doing things that are wrong. And once they're born again, being his child, and, and look, you may say this is academic, and I'm not saying this is right or good, but if God's word can't fail, nowhere does it say they will never renounce me. They will never, you know, forsake me. Peter forsook Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach that or say that anywhere. The Calvinists imply that, well, if you do that, then you're never saved to begin with. I'm not going to say that that's the case because... We know that God can't break his promise. If a person's saved, nothing can change it. And it doesn't mean they were unsaved because getting saved is easy. You just have to put your faith in Christ. But as we're going to see here, now I've got enough time to get through some of this. 
how they talk out of both sides of their mouth and they introduce the works of the salvation into their damnable, heretical doctrine that they teach when it comes to this perseverance of, this, of, of the saints. I picked two, there's a lot of information out there for this, I mean, a lot of people follow this stuff. A lot of people do. I picked two people that are very popular, well-known names that, that have spread this broadly. Um, John MacArthur being one of them and John Piper being another. They're real famous on the internet and they have these big ministries and people have heard these things. There's, there's a lot of those John MacArthur study Bibles out there and stuff. So I wanted to use these people specifically. They're not the originator of the doctrines by any means, but they're, they're, they're people that, um, that, have, that are commonly quoted and people look to as an authority in, uh, in, in doctrine. I don't know why, but um, I'm going to expose them a little bit right now. So this comes from the Grace to You website, which is John MacArthur's website. Uh, there's no author associated with this post, so I'm just going to read what it is, assume it's from MacArthur, or at least it's authorized by him. Uh, and I'm just going to read this for you. This was an article posted on the website. It says, John Murray in a Redemption Accomplished and Applied wrote the following. So there's an excerpt from this book. In order to place the doctrine of perseverance in proper light, we need to know what it is not. It does not mean that everyone who professes faith in Christ and who is accepted as a believer in the fellowship of the saints is secure for eternity and may entertain the assurance of eternal salvation. And you got to be, you know, they're going to be really tricky with their words. Because we don't believe this either, that just if someone just professes that they have, you know, a lot of people can lie. You have to believe with your heart, right? We don't just say, well, if someone just prayed a prayer, because this is what they always like to say, oh, you easy believism people. You just say if you pray a prayer, then you're just saved. No, you have to believe with your heart. I mean, it has to be genuine. There has to be a genuine faith in order to be saved. We're not going to dispute that. So this statement is worded very carefully, but I, I, I'm okay with, with it as it stands, right? Just some profession of faith. But see, we have nothing else really to go off of than a person's profession. You know, if they're going to say that they put their faith in Jesus Christ and they're trusting Him alone as their Savior, then I'm going to say that they're saved. Because, you know, that's uh, otherwise I'm just going to have to call them a liar. The Bible says our Lord Himself, or not the Bible, excuse me, this is far from the Bible. This article says, Our Lord himself warned his followers in the days of his flesh when he said to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this is quoting John 8, 31 and 32 in their false version of the Bible. He says, uh, it says here, he set up a criterion by which true disciples might be distinguished and that criterion is continuance in Jesus' word. So, notice what they did here. They took a statement of Jesus referring to being his disciple and applied that to being saved. Now, someone who is a disciple is a follower. I mean, that, that is the definition. If you're going to be a disciple of anything, you are a follower of that. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you are going to be a follower of Christ. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, then what does that mean? You're going to be doing the works and following Him and doing whatever it is that He said for you to do. Now, is that what we have to do to be saved? To be a follower of Him? No. The Bible says we have to believe. So they've, they've, they've changed this to say, see, you have to persevere. Well, no, you, okay, you do have to persevere to be a disciple, but you don't have to be a disciple to be saved. And that's the analogy they made without actually stating it. Right. And that's how subtle this teaching can be. And when you're reading this, not that you're reading this book, if you're not really sharp and picking up on this stuff, you could just go from point A to point B without realizing, wait a minute, that's not right. And this is how they deceive people and trick them into thinking, oh, well, yeah, see, there it is in the Bible. We have to continue. We have to do the work. Otherwise, I'm not really saved. And then, and then it goes on. This article goes on and says, The above explanation by Murray of the doctrine of perseverance is an elaboration 
of what Peter meant by his words, protected by the power of God when he wrote his first epistle, 1 Peter 1.5. So this John, you know, that quote I read you is from this book, but John MacArthur is endorsing this and saying, see, this is what it means. This is exactly what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about persevering. It has nothing to do with the salvation. It has to do with being a disciple of Christ. I'm going to read for you a little bit from John Piper's you know, website or article or whatever, you know, where I got this information from. There's so many points on here. I mean, this, and I really started to feel stupid after reading this, like getting dumber because of their lack of, of understanding at all. And the reason why is because they're blind. They're blind leaders of the blind. And I have no problem saying that John Piper and John MacArthur are false prophets. They don't believe the gospel of God. They believe in this works-based salvation. They believe in this lordship salvation that says you have to do work in order to be saved. And they're never going to come out and actually say it that clearly. They're going to disguise it and wrap it up some other way to, but like, like this to say, well, see, if you're not doing the works and you're not a disciple of Christ, so therefore you're not saved. Well, wait a minute. I may not be a disciple of Christ, but it doesn't mean I'm not saved. So reading from this article, it says, it follows from what we saw in the last section. And this was, this whole thing that I'm pulling this clip from was explaining Calvinism. So Tulip, I told you before, P is the last point. So they had already explained all of the other nonsense, the other four points in Calvinism. So it follows from what we saw in the last section that the people of God will persevere to the end and not be lost. The foreknown are predestined, the predestined are called, the called are justified, and the justified are glorified. No one is lost from this group. To belong to this people is to be eternally secure. Well, yeah, to belong to those people is to be eternally secure. But the problem comes in is just saying, well, then how do we belong to them? Now, then this continues on. But we mean more than this by the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We mean that the saints will and must persevere in faith and the obedience which comes from faith. If you are, say, it says, you will and you must persevere, which means continue in your faith and the obedience. Obedience to what? God's word. Obedience to what? The law. Doing what God told you to do, his commandments. It says election is unconditional. Well, that's already a foul. That's a false. It is conditional. If you believe with all their heart. If you believe on the Lord Jesus. That's a condition. That word if. Whosoever believeth. That's a condition. They say election is unconditional, but glorification is not. There are many warnings in Scripture that those who do not hold fast to Christ can be lost in the end. And John Piper is a lot more bold than just coming out with saying, basically, you can lose your salvation. But when you read through it, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth saying, well, I'm not saying you can lose your salvation, but if you're not sick and close to Christ, you could be lost in the end. Okay. What's the difference? And as it goes on, it says, the following eight theses are my summary of this crucial doctrine. Don't worry, I am not going to give you his eight theses. <laughs> because that is, that is way more boring than anything that I've been going through already tonight. Uh, I'm just going to give you one, the first one, and then, and then we're going to close with this. He says, our faith must endure to the end if we are to be saved. <laughs> This means that the gospel is God's instrument in the preservation of faith as well as the begetting of faith. Does that sound clear to anybody here? I mean, is that statement? I'll read it again. This means that the gospel is God's instrument in the preservation of faith as well as the begetting of faith. We do not act with a kind of cavalier indifference to the call for perseverance just because a person has professed faith in Christ as though we can be assured from our perspective that they are now beyond the reach of the evil one. There is a fight of faith to be fought 
the elect will fight that fight. And by God's sovereign, there's that word sovereign, right? by God's sovereign grace, they will win it. We must endure to the end in faith if we are to be saved. Endure to the end. So I suppose that they would look at Solomon and say that he wasn't really saved. Now, I'm sure they're not going to say that. But according to their doctrine, see, they're, they're going to talk out of both sides of their mouth. And you can never, it's really hard to nail these people down on the specifics. And usually when you do, they're going to use sentences like that one first verse, that's the first sentence. What are you even saying? What, literally, what are you even saying? What point are you trying to get across? The gospel is God's instrument to, you know, like, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's something that's real simple to believe. Put your faith on, you know, what they do is they try to use a lot of words and with their much speaking, they confuse people. And you'll be like, huh, what? I don't get it. And then, but they try to speak with authority and say, no, this is what the Bible says. Oh, okay. And you don't want to feel stupid and say, well, I don't even get what you're saying. So I'm just going to believe this person because I don't want to make it, I don't want to look like an idiot when really they're the idiot who doesn't understand the Bible at all. So don't feel like an idiot when you hear this stupid speaking from these Calvinists because it really is stupid speaking. They're, they're, they're subtle, they're slick, they're going to try to, to, to say something like being a disciple is the same as being saved. They're not. You have to watch very carefully what their words are and call them out on it. Solomon, for those of you who don't know, started his life off great. He started his life off seeking God. He started his life off getting a lot of wisdom from God and you know, penning down the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and all these great works of God. But in the end of his life, because he didn't obey God's commandments and he went after strange women and he had all these wives, they turned his heart away from God. And this is what the Bible says. His heart was turned away from serving God and he built you know, altars unto false gods and because of that, God punished him for that. But it doesn't mean that Solomon was just all of a sudden he just wasn't saved because he didn't endure unto the end. It's nonsense. Now, should we endure? Should we persevere? Absolutely. But is it a guarantee? No. That's why we're admonished. Look, we have the flesh and we have the spirit and there's a war for every single day in your own body. If you're saved, your spirit wants to do what's right and your flesh wants to do what's wrong. We need to persevere, not to get to heaven, not to make sure that we're saved. Jesus already took care of that for us. We ought to persevere to earn that crown, to receive the rewards, to do good to other people, to not receive the chastisement of God, to not be punished for doing what's wrong, to not you know, be punished for all these things where we're not observing His commandments and doing His things like we saw in Psalm 89, but that we can just receive blessing from God. It's not tied in with salvation. And none of the, you know, anytime we're talking about salvation, especially with Calvinism, they go into these, these real in-depth theology studies. But just look at the context. And, and it should be crystal clear, is this talking about salvation? Eternal salvation of the soul. When we're talking about your soul's salvation, you're going to see words like eternal life. Everlasting life, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, right? Things like that. Like in John chapter 3, you know, verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's talking about salvation. Having eternal life, that's talking about salvation. But just some random verses about obeying God and being his disciple, that's not talking about salvation. Some verses that, that admonish you to keep the law. And to, and to endure and to, and to keep the, and to fight the fight and, and to do all these good things, that's not talking about salvation. It's talking about how we ought to live our life. So um, hopefully I didn't bore you to death with that. That's the, the P part of their, their, um, their tulip, their, uh, their pansy, flowery uh, doctrine of, of perseverance under the end. We ought to persevere. But we also ought to understand that we are preserved through, you know, through Jesus Christ, from the promise that God made that cannot fail. We are preserved in Him. Um, what we choose with our free will to do with that is up to us, but it's not without consequence. If we choose not to obey God's commandments, He's going to chastise us, He's going to discipline us, 
and we're not going to be earning rewards. If we choose to do what's right and obey Him, we'll be blessed and we will receive rewards. It's as simple as that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of the, the Bible. God, help us to understand these doctrines and to get them um, established in our hearts and, and to just, if nothing else, dear Lord, come away from this sermon knowing that we have to get everything in the context and not just let someone sneakily or slyly come in and, and try to um, pervert the gospel, pervert the truth by, um, by being very subtle and, and, and using scripture where, where it doesn't support the context, Lord. Help us all be diligent in our own studies. Help us to be diligent in the things that we hear and to test them and to prove them against your words, to not just be lazy if we read a book or if we hear somebody say something to, and they give some reference or they give some Bible verse. Help us all not to be lazy in, uh, in actually verifying that and just assume that what they're saying is right. I don't think we should ever assume that what we're being told is right. We should always be comparing Scripture with Scripture. And we should always be validating what we're being taught, Lord. Help us to be diligent with that and to treat your, the doctrines uh, that come from your word with, with the utmost importance, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us all to be equipped to better answer and handle uh, these people who have perverted doctrines. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.